last week and whose funeral is taking place just now. I didn't know Lyra, but everything I have read by her and about her makes me wish I had. Talented, passionate, courageous, she was a symbol of hope for Northern Ireland's future. Her death is a harsh reminder of the fragility of peace in Northern Ireland and of how important it is that that peace is nurtured and protected. I would also like to express my shock and sadness at the horrific attacks in Sri Lanka on Sunday. Senseless loss of life on such a scale is difficult for any of us to comprehend. And my heartfelt condolences go to the bereaved and injured, including, of course, the British citizens so tragically affected. To launch indiscriminate attacks on innocent people as they attended Easter services or enjoyed a holiday is barbaric beyond words. Christian churches like mosques, synagogues and all places of worship should be sanctuaries of peace and safety. As we condemn unreservedly these acts of terrorism, we must again express our determination that hatred and violence will be defeated by love, compassion and by our common humanity. Presiding officer, my statement today will consider the implications for Scotland of recent Brexit developments. As members know, uh, two weeks ago, the European Council extended the UK's membership of the EU until the 31st of October, with a right for the UK to leave earlier if the House of Commons agrees terms of withdrawal. The extension granted by the EU rescued us from the nightmare scenario of a no-deal Brexit on the 12th of April. As a result, I can advise Parliament that the Scottish Government has, for the time being, scaled down our no-deal planning. Uh, my thanks go to all those across government and the public sector who've worked so hard to make sure Scotland is as ready as we can be for what would be a catastrophic outcome. However, I also want to express my regret and anger at the money and effort that has been spent preparing for an outcome that the UK government should have ruled out. As things stand, if an agreed way forward is not found quickly, the risk of no deal will rise again as we approach the October deadline with the potential for yet more money, time and effort to be wasted. The UK government could remove this risk now by making clear that if the only alternative is a no deal exit, it will choose to revoke Article 50 instead. And I hope members across the chamber will join me today in calling on the UK government to do exactly that. However, the extension afforded by the EU presents the UK with an opportunity to find a positive way forward and an opportunity for me to update Parliament about the implications for Scotland. The view of the Scottish Government is that the best way to break the deadlock for the UK is to put the issue back to the people with an option to remain in the EU. The Euro elections will also give voters a chance to back a party like the SNP that wants to keep Scotland in the European Union. Of course, almost three years on from the referendum in 2016, it is impossible to predict with certainty what will happen next. The UK might still leave the EU before October, it might leave in October, it might seek another extension or it might not leave at all. This chaos was not an inevitable consequence of the vote to leave the EU. It is down to a toxic combination of dishonesty and incompetence. Those who campaigned for leave in 2016 failed to set out what Brexit would mean in reality. To the extent that they made any attempt at all, they misled people. The UK government triggered Article 50 before it had answered that question. The Prime Minister then boxed herself in with a series of self-defeating and contradictory red lines. Instead of trying to build consensus across Parliament or country, she claimed the right to interpret the result in the most hardline way possible. As a consequence, those who voted to remain question the legitimacy of the whole process. Those who voted leave feel with justification that promises made to them have been broken and faith in democracy has been damaged. Throughout all of this, the Scottish Government and our party colleagues at Westminster have worked tirelessly to help find the best way forward for all of the UK. Yeah. Whatever Scotland's constitutional status in future, it will always be in our interest for all of us on these islands to have the closest possible relationship with the EU. So we proposed the compromise option of single market and customs union membership. We back a public vote to break the deadlock, even though that offers no guarantee that Scotland won't be outvoted 
all over again. And we're working with others in an effort to remove the risk of a no-deal Brexit. In fact, we have done everything possible to help avert the Brexit crisis for the whole UK. And, presiding officer, we will continue to do so. But we must also consider the best way forward for Scotland in the event that the UK does leave the European Union. And to ensure that all options remain open to us, the time to do that is now. Of course, as we do so, we must learn the lessons of the Brexit mess. Whether we like it or not, the continued lack of clarity around Brexit has implications for Scotland's decision making, a point I will return to later. But there is surely one point of clarity that has emerged over the past three years, even for the most ardent opponent of Scottish independence. The Westminster system of government simply does not serve Scotland's interests. And the devolution settlement in its current form is now seen to be utterly inadequate to the task of protecting those interests. In other words, the status quo is broken. Scotland's 62% vote to remain in the EU counted for nothing. Far from being an equal partner at Westminster, Scotland's voice is listened to only if it chimes with the UK majority. If it doesn't, we are outvoted and ignored. The Scottish Government's efforts to find a compromise that might mitigate the damage to our economy fell on deaf ears. Cross-party votes of this Parliament have been disregarded time and time again. The agreed constitutional principles which have underpinned devolution since its establishment 20 years ago have been cast aside by the UK Government. And vital powers were effectively taken from this Parliament without our consent. Yeah. Even our financial settlement, which already leaves us vulnerable to austerity, with too few levers of our own, was openly breached with the UK Government's bribe to the DUP. Yeah. There is, presiding officer, no denying that Brexit has exposed a deep democratic deficit at the heart of how Scotland is governed. And whatever our different views on independence, it should persuade all of us in this chamber that we need a more solid foundation on which to build our future as a country. The consequences of inaction would be severe. If we are unable to stop or even mitigate Brexit, we will find it harder to export our goods and services across the single market. Scotland will become less attractive to inward investors a risk that will be compounded if the Northern Ireland backstop takes effect. The result will be fewer jobs and an economy that is smaller than it should be. The Tory, and I'm sorry to say, UK Labour obsession that drives the desire to leave the EU, ending free movement, will restrict the opportunities of our own young people to live, work yep. and study across Europe. Yes. And it will send our working age population into decline. Now I know that the issue of migration is not an easy one for politicians to address, but I am proud that parties across this chamber are willing to take on the many myths that surround it. In Scotland, we know, we understand that the Westminster approach to migration, as well as being deeply inhumane, poses an almost existential threat to our future prosperity. So the Brexit outlook for Scotland is this, a smaller economy, restricted job growth, fewer people, narrowed horizons and greater pressure on our ability to fund the public services and social contract that we value so highly. Let me put it in simpler language. Brexit and all that flows from Brexit will affect the ability of Scottish governments now and well into the future to do the day job, to support businesses, combat poverty, fund the NHS and public services and work with other countries the to tackle the, the defining challenges of our time. And at a time when I think most people in Scotland would want to see this Parliament having more influence on the decisions that shape our future, there is a risk of the reverse. As the UK scrambles to do trade deals with Donald Trump or whoever, 
The inclination to impose uniformity, even in devolved areas, will lead to more Westminster centralisation. It is my judgment now that for the first time in 20 years, there is a risk of devolution going backwards. Yeah. Not through blatant wholesale removal of powers, although on recent experience, more of that can't be ruled out, but by an increasing use of Westminster's powers to override the decisions of this parliament and constrain devolved decision-making. So the question, presiding officer, that confronts us, confronts all of us now is this one. If the status quo is not fit for purpose, and I know even some of the most committed believers in the union find it hard to argue that it is, how do we fix that? And can we do so in a way that maximizes consensus rather than amplifying our differences? These are not easy challenges, but those of us, those of us who sit in this chamber those of us who sit in this chamber, all of us who sit in this chamber, are elected to represent the national interest. We have a duty to rise to that challenge, to stand in each other's shoes and find a way forward. No one expects any of us to abandon deeply held beliefs. Just as Labour and Tory MSPs will continue to believe that remaining in the union is the right option for Scotland, I will argue that independence offers the best future. Yeah. That case for independence is even stronger now, given the profound changes that have taken place in the UK since 2014. In that time, we have seen the limits of Scotland's influence within the UK, and in sharp contrast to that, the power independent nations have as members of the EU. Yeah. While Scotland's interests have been ignored by Westminster, independent Ireland's have been protected Absolutely. by the EU. Yeah. And of the 27 independent countries that decided the UK's future at the EU Council two weeks ago, around a dozen are smaller than or similar in size to Scotland. Many of these countries are also more prosperous than Scotland. With all of our assets and talents, Scotland should be a thriving and driving force within Europe. Instead, we face being forced to the margins, sidelined within a UK that is itself increasingly sidelined on the international stage. Yep. Independence, by contrast, would allow us to protect our place in Europe. It would enable us to nurture our most important relationships, those with the other countries of the British Isles, on the basis of equality. And it would mean that decisions against our will and contrary to our interests cannot be imposed on us by Westminster. It would put our future into our own hands with the decisions that shape our future and determine our relationship with other countries taken here in our own parliament. That is the essence of independence. So let me turn then to the issue of when I think people in Scotland should be offered a new choice of independence. My party was elected with a mandate to offer that choice within this parliamentary term should Scotland be taken out of the EU against our will. There is also a majority in this chamber for that position. And polling evidence suggests that a majority in Scotland want a choice on independence, though opinions vary on timing. There are some who would like to see a very early referendum. Others want that choice to be much later. My job as First Minister is to reach a judgment not simply in my party's interest, but in the national interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In doing so, a key priority is ensuring that we learn the lessons of Brexit. To rush into an immediate decision before a Brexit path has been determined would not allow for an informed choice to be made. However, if we are to safeguard Scotland's interests, we cannot wait indefinitely. That is why I consider that a choice between Brexit and a future for Scotland as an independent European nation should be offered in the lifetime of this Parliament. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If Scotland is taken out of the EU, the option of a referendum of in on independence within that time scale must be open to us. That would be our route to avoiding the worst of the damage Brexit will do. Of course, that intention does not mean that we should cease trying to build as much agreement on the best way forward as we can, nor should we cease our efforts to avoid any Brexit at all. 
We must also try in all of our actions to avoid the mistakes that have caused so much division over Brexit and instead bring people together to focus on finding the common ground that does, I believe, exist between us. Our aim must be to act in a completely different manner to the UK government and parliament. The fact is, presiding officer, based on the evidence of the last three years, Westminster has failed. It has failed to protect Scotland's interests. It has failed to reach consensus and it has degenerated into utter chaos. It is now time for this parliament, for all the parties represented in this parliament to take charge. There are therefore three specific steps that the Scottish Government intends to take now. Firstly, I can confirm that the Scottish Government will act to ensure that the option of giving people a choice on independence later in this term of Parliament is progressed. We will shortly introduce legislation to set the rules for any referendum that is now or in the future within the competence of the Scottish Parliament. We will aim for this legislation to be on the statute book by the end of this year. Mike Russell will set out the details next month. Uh, we do not need a transfer of power, such as a Section 30 order, to pass such a framework bill, though we would need it to put beyond doubt or challenge our ability to apply the bill to an independence referendum. Of course, as members are aware, the UK government's current position is that it will not agree to transfer power. I believe that position will prove to be unsustainable. However, by making progress with primary legislation first, we won't squander valuable time now in a standoff, <laughs> in a standoff with a UK Not government that may soon be out of office. We will seek agreement to a transfer of power at an appropriate point during or shortly after the bill's passage on the basis that it will be exercised when this parliament and no other considers it right to offer the people of Scotland a choice. In 2014, the Scottish and UK governments and parliaments, to our collective credit, set the gold standard. Two governments with very different views on the outcome came together to agree a process that allowed the people to decide. That is what should happen in future too. It is how we will secure unquestioned legitimacy, not just here at home, but crucially within the EU and the wider international community too. And it respects the principle enshrined in the claim of right that the Scottish people are sovereign. Mm -hmm. Those who oppose independence are, of course, entitled to argue that case, but it must be for the people to decide. Uh, lastly, on this point, let me offer uh, these words. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. Uh, these are the wise words of Abraham Lincoln, an ardent defender of a union albeit in a great moral cause. Uh, for those of us who support independence, his lesson is obvious. If we are successful in further growing the support and the demand for independence, and I will say more later this week about how we build that case, then no UK government will be able to deny the will of the people or stop that will being expressed. Yeah, yeah. officer, let me now turn to two parallel processes I want to outline today. Uh, the first is directed to the parties in this chamber who do not support independence. Uh, I may not, as you may have noticed, agree with that view, but I do respect that view. <laughs> However, what I hope we might all agree on after these past three years is that serious change is needed. So to those who believe that independence is not the right change for Scotland, I say this, bring forward your own proposals to equip our parliament with the powers we need to better protect and advance our interests. For example, more powers to boost trade and strengthen our economy. More powers to tackle poverty and inequality. Powers to protect the public finances that our NHS and public services rely on. Powers Order, that will allow us to grow our population. Powers that will give us a stronger voice in the UK, enable us to determine our own future and better protect our interests here at home and internationally. Um, I welcome, for example, the recent signals from the Scottish Labour Party that they now 
support the devolution of employment law. Uh, this parliament was almost unanimous in opposing the Brexit power grab. And I know that many share our deep concerns on migration and recognise that we do not currently have the tools to solve this problem. So perhaps, presiding officer, there is already more common ground than we like to admit there is, a starting point that we can build and expand upon. The fact that we do not agree on Scotland's ultimate destination should not stop us travelling together as far as we can. I have therefore asked Mike Russell to explore with other parties, uh, perhaps with the help of a respected and independent individual who could broker such discussions, areas of agreement on constitutional and procedural change, and also take the views of stakeholders about such issues. Uh, I will write to party leaders today, and Mike Russell will be in touch with their nominated representatives thereafter to consider how these discussions might be progressed. And this should be an exercise if parties can find it within themselves uh, to do so. It should be an exercise that doesn't start with the fixed positions of any of us, but one that considers openly the challenges Scotland faces and what solutions might help us to address them. If serious and substantial proposals emerge, this Parliament could then present them to the UK Government in a unified and united way. If other parties are willing, I give an assurance today that the Scottish Government will engage fully and in good faith. Presiding officer, the last aspect of my statement today is also about how we confront the change our country needs, but in a way that does try to build agreement. Uh, none of us can fail to be concerned about the polarisation of political debate caused by the Brexit experience. Uh, the answer, though, cannot be to ignore or to suppress the differing views about the best future for our country. However, we should try to find ways of debating our choices respectfully and in a way that seeks maximum areas of agreement. We should lay a foundation that allows us to move forward together whatever decisions we ultimately arrive at. I have been struck recently by the Irish example of a citizens' assembly to help find consensus on issues where people have sharply divided opinions. Of course, the circumstances here are different as are the issues under consideration. But the principle is a sound one, and I believe we should make use of it. So I can confirm that the Scottish Government will establish a citizens' assembly. It will bring together a representative cross-section of Scotland with an independent chair and be tasked with considering, in broad terms, the following issues. What kind of country are we seeking to build? How can we best overcome the challenges we face, including those arising from Brexit? And what further work should be carried out to give people the detail they need to make informed choices about the future of the country? Again, Mike Russell will set out more details shortly and seek views from other parties on the operation and remit. Presiding officer, Brexit was not the choice of this parliament, uh, nor was it the choice of our country. As I said at the outset, the immediate opportunity we now have is to help stop Brexit for the whole UK and we should seize that opportunity uh, and my party will certainly seek to do so. But if that cannot be achieved, dealing with the consequences of Brexit and facing up to its challenges will be unavoidable. I am aware that the debates that flow from that will provoke differences of opinion. I believe that the case for independence is now stronger than ever and I will make that case and as I have set out today I will also do all in my power to protect Scotland's right to choose. To do anything less would risk consigning the next generation to the damage of Westminster decisions that are not in our interests. But I know that others take a different view so as the necessary legislative steps over the next few months are taken I will also seek to open up space for us to come together and find areas of agreement as mature politicians should do. And in so doing, try to set an example of constructive, outward-looking and respectful debate. In recent times, we have seen in Westminster what happens when parties fail to work together, when leaders take a my way or the highway approach and when so many red lines and inflexible preconditions are set that progress becomes impossible. Tensions rise and tempers free. 
20 years on from the establishment of this parliament, I believe we can do better than that. Brexit makes change for Scotland inevitable, but our fellow citizens will judge us on how we lead debate on the best way forward and the efforts we make to come to a common mind about it. This place was established with the hope that it would be a new type of parliament. Um, I think we are, but we can prove it anew by the way in which we respond today to the challenges that lie before us. We can show that we have already begun to learn not just the lessons from Westminster's failure, but also those that Scotland has taught us as devolution has grown and strengthened. We can show that we are able to put the interests of the people first. So if others across this chamber are willing to move forward in that spirit, they will find in me an equally willing partner. But if all they have to offer the people of Scotland is a failed and a damaging status quo, then the process of change will pass them by and support for independence will continue to grow. Presiding officer, it is time in my view to look to Scotland's future. Let us do so together with confidence in the potential of our country and with confidence in the potential of all those who live here. I commend this statement to Parliament. Thank you very much. The First Minister will now take questions. Jackson Carlo. Presiding officer, let me too begin by adding my condolences and those of all Scottish Conservatives to the family of Lyra McKee. Her death at the hands of the IRA is a tragedy, is a waste of a talented young life. We all stand united to condemn the cowards who took her life and to assure that peace in Northern Ireland prevails. And following the shocks of Pittsburgh and Christchurch, we yet again join our voices with all those appalled at the horrendous attack in Sri Lanka and our sympathies with all those horribly affected. This was an outrageous attack on us all. And perhaps the First Minister could confirm later whether we know of any Scottish citizens caught up in these events. Turning then to the substance of today's statement, whatever the First Minister claims, and for all the warm words about being inclusive, her statement is inherently divisive. Astonishingly, the way the First Minister thinks we come together is for the people of Scotland to be plunged into another divisive referendum within the next 18 months. First Minister, this is just absurd. It is a ridiculous, even disgraceful skewering of your priorities with the real priorities of the country. And frankly, my first reaction when told of its delivery today, as Scotland was enjoying the Easter celebration, was to ask why on earth the First Minister felt it necessary to float a dark cloud over Scotland's sunny spring by updating us on our plan for a second independence referendum. And then, of course, I remembered there is another SNP conference coming this weekend. And the only thought of the SNP amplified today is how to justify their plans to divide families, workplaces and communities all over again and for the foreseeable future. Well, not in the name of the majority of Scotland. Here, here. Presiding officer, whether you voted to remain or leave in 2016, the last few weeks have fallen far short of what we all wanted to see. In a Westminster of minorities, competing interests have prevailed. There is, of course, a way to sort this. It is to respect the result of the 2016 referendum and support an orderly Brexit. I want that to happen. I urge everyone at Westminster to now work in a spirit of compromise and cooperation to achieve that. That way the country can move on. But yet again today, we see a First Minister who once again focuses instead on our own priorities, rummaging around to create a shopping list of continued constitutional initiatives, however weak and divisive. And there is a big difference between now and 10 years ago. The request for a Section 30 order then which led to our once-in-a-lifetime independence referendum in 2014, was supported in this place with the votes of all the political parties here represented. We all agreed then that the question deserved to be answered. That was the process then. But no such coalition exists for more constitutional politics today. For the majority of Scotland, the last decade of constitutional politics and division has been more than enough. For the majority of the parties here, we believe that by using the existing powers of this parliament and the potential of our people, 
we can succeed. We believe in disavowing more constitutional division and focusing all our energy on things that all of us agree are important, delivering better education, health and existing uh, and economic growth for Scotland now. Yeah. Yet I'm afraid the depressing reality is this. For the SNP, independence and the means to try and deliver it is its central purpose. For them, it is a prerequisite, the essential step to Scotland being all it can be. It simply does not believe we can succeed as we are. Nicola Sturgeon has confirmed that again today when her own words, she boldly states that the devolution settlement is utterly inadequate. No First Minister, it is not, but it makes the choice clear. Scotland has had enough of constitutional politics and division. With the SNP, more of it is now utterly and clearly inedible, inevitable. We say no more, enough is enough. First Minister. Yeah, well, I fear that was a lot of sound and fury signifying not very much Indeed. at all. Uh, Jason, Carlaw, Jason Carlaw referred to a dark cloud. Can I point out to Jackson Carlaw that there is right now a dark cloud over Scotland. It is not in the name of the majority of the Scottish people and devolution is incapable of protecting Scotland from it. And that dark cloud is called Brexit. Yes. Yep. Now, I can understand, I really can understand why the Tories want to bury their heads in the sand and pretend that this Brexit mess is not happening because it shines a very, very harsh light on both the ideology and the incompetence of the Conservative Party. But it is not fair or good enough to expect Scotland to pretend that Brexit is not happening. Nor is it good enough for Jackson Carlaw to effectively say to Scotland, whisht about it all, yeah. don't say anything, because we have a yeah. duty, presiding yeah. officer, Given the damage that all of us know, even the Tories in their hearts know, Brexit is going to do to this country. We have a duty to those of us living in Scotland now and for generations to come to protect Scotland from that and to find a way of building a future that is better, more prosperous and keeps us at the heart of Europe. And that is what my statement today is focused on doing. Now, Jackson Carlaw seems to say there is nothing wrong with the status quo, although it hasn't protected and can't protect Scotland from Brexit. Uh, Murdo Fraser seems to take yes. a different yes. view. Yes. It is only a couple yes. of days ago that Murdo Fraser was saying that the current system had to change yep. and putting forward yes. proposals, yeah. proposals as it happens that yes. I don't agree with, but credit yes. to him, yes. proposals yes. for change. So I will end this answer again on a note of attempted consensus. The Scottish Conservatives, and I respect this, uh, take the view that independence is not the right way of fixing what is broken about our current system. If that's not uh, their view then, uh, bring forward the proposals for change that you think would be right. That is the open offer we make to the Conservatives today. And over the days, weeks and months that lie ahead, we are going to find out whether the Conservatives really have any interest in protecting Scotland or whether all the Scottish Conservatives will ever do uh, when their Westminster bosses tell them to jump is ask how high. Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, uh, can I begin by adding the support of the Scottish Labour Party to the First Minister's comments on Lyra McKee and on the Sri Lankan terror attack? Presiding officer, Timing is everything in politics. And the timing of this statement is nothing to do with where we are in the chaos of Brexit. It's got nothing to do with where the polls are on the creation of a separate Scottish state. In other words, it's got nothing to do with where Abraham Lincoln's public sentiment is on the falling demand for a rerun of the 2014 referendum. But the timing of this statement has everything to do with the First Minister's party conference taking place in just three days' time. The First Minister is using this parliamentary platform for a party platform, and in that she is devaluing the office which she holds. Responsible political leadership means that I will work with the First Minister on stopping a no-deal Brexit. It means in the event of Brexit, 
of acting to ensure that powers are repatriated to the right level of government. And I will continue to argue for more powers for this parliament. But responsible leadership also means getting out of parliament and listening to and so better understanding the daily lived experiences of people across Scotland. The First Minister should know that this debate is a distraction from the real and serious problems Absolutely. Scotland faces. A low pay economy, exhausted public services, one in four children living Absolutely. in poverty. What is worse is that the First Minister knows fine well that there is no evidence whatsoever that the people of Scotland want another independence referendum. And no wonder, when the chaos of Brexit throws into sharp relief the challenges of leaving a political and economic union. So despite her protestations, isn't the First Minister today plainly putting the interests of her party before the interests of this country? First Minister. Firstly, on, on the issues of timing, um, I am prepared to bet, Presiding Officer, that given that the European uh, Council agreed an extension to the UK's membership at the week uh, after this Parliament went into recess, that if I hadn't offered to make a statement about the implications mm. of Brexit, the opposition would have been demanding <laughs> that I did. <laughs> uh, equally, yeah, had I chosen exactly to go to my party conference and say what I've just said here today to them, the opposition would have been queuing up to yeah. accuse me of disrespecting exactly. Parliament. Yeah. That is uh, the reality. Uh, but on, on the substantive issues, I understand, as I said a moment ago, why uh, the Conservatives want to pretend that this Brexit mess is not happening. I don't understand why that is the case for Labour, nor do, as an aside, nor will I ever understand why Labour seem to support independence for countries all over the world, uh, but oppose it so yeah. strongly for their yeah. own country yeah. here yeah. in yeah. Scotland. Uh, but absolutely. when I agree with Richard Leonard is on uh, two things. Firstly, I absolutely agree uh, about uh, testing public opinion. Uh, the last test of public opinion in Scotland, of course, was a by-election in this city uh, just a, a week or so ago. Uh, SNP won it with an increased vote. Labour uh, vote went down. Independent supporting parties won a majority of the vote. So there are plenty of tests of public opinion that I'm happy to trade uh, with Richard Leonard. But on the substantive issue about powers for this parliament, that comes back to the heart of my premise today. Nobody with the interests of Scotland at heart, and I, I believe that is everybody in this chamber has the interests of Scotland at heart. Nobody can look at the situation and conclude that it is working for Scotland. We face being taken out of the European Union against our will with all of the consequences that flow from that. So surely we must come together and decide what to do in response to that. Uh, my view, as you know, as everybody knows, is that we should become a normal independent country uh, like the other independent countries of the European Union and come together to work with them on the basis of equality. But if Richard Leonard believes that's not the best future, then come forward, uh, not just with a, a vague call for more powers, but sit down and talk to us about specifically the powers that we think this parliament should have. That offer is open to Richard Leonard, just as it is open to Jackson Carlaw and the other parties in this chamber. So the question for the other parties who oppose independence as they have every right to do, is are they going to rise to the challenge of bringing forward real proposals about how we put things right and ensure that this country in future cannot have decisions that damage our interests imposed on us by Westminster? That's the question, and we will see over the coming weeks whether the other parties in this chamber can rise to that challenge. I call Alison Johnson to be followed by Willie Rennie. Alison Johnson. Thank you. With fellow members, the Scottish Greens pay our respects to Lyra McKee. Our thoughts are with her family and friends and to all affected by the shocking bombings in Sri Lanka. Greens believe that Scotland's future should be in Scotland's hands as an independent nation at the heart of Europe. Mm -hmm. The Brexit shambles confirms our belief that we would be far better governing ourselves. So we welcome the First Minister's statement today. Support for independence grew over the course of the last referendum, in part due to the breadth of inspiring visions of what our nation could be. 
Now, the economic vision currently being considered by the SNP looks more like the failed model of the UK than the bold vision for independence that the Greens believe in. Mm -hmm. So can I ask the First Minister, will the citizens' assemblies, which we welcome, inform the prospectus put forward by the government in the referendum, and will the offer put to the people of Scotland be one shaped by the people? Thank you. First Minister. Well, can I welcome the Green support for uh, the statement today? Can I obviously welcome the Green support for Scotland becoming uh, an independent country? Uh, and actually, uh, what uh, has just been demonstrated there is the essence of independence. People can have different views on policies, different views on uh, the direction of the country. But the key point that unites us is that those decisions should lie in the hands of the Scottish people and not be imposed upon us by Westminster. That's uh, the reality that independent countries all over the world uh, take for granted. In terms of the Citizens' Assembly, we will uh, discuss the remit, as I said in my statement, and operation of that with other parties, if other parties are willing to have that uh, discussion. And that is very much uh, about opening this process uh, to people that are not politicians, to those uh, across Scotland, a representative section of the Scottish population, to start to look at and consider these big questions about the future of our country. And uh, I hope that the Greens will take uh, part in that in the spirit in which it is intended. Uh, and then we can uh, try. These are things not easy. There is no inevitability about it. But all of us can try notwithstanding the differences of opinion we have that are valid in any democracy, to come together and see if we can find areas of agreement and consensus. I think particularly now, uh, given all that has happened in the past three years, there is a real responsibility in politicians not to put aside uh, those things we believe in passionately, uh, but nevertheless, notwithstanding uh, those passionate disagreements, to come together to find that consensus. I am willing to do that. I, uh, trust the Greens will be willing to do that and I hope the other parties, uh, once they've had some opportunity to think about it and reflect on it, will be willing to do that as well. Call Willie Rennie to be followed by Keith Brown. Willie Rennie. Uh, my thoughts are with the friends and family of Lyra McKee and also those affected by the atrocities of recent days across the world. The First Minister pleads for consensus, but how can we take her proposals on consensus for more power seriously? when John Swinney, sitting right next to her, a member of the Smith Commission, trashed that commission within minutes of the report being published. How can we take their pleas for consensus seriously when they treat a well-established process like that? And in our statement today, the First Minister hasn't done the one decent thing that people in Scotland want her to do, which is to make it stop and take our campaign for independence off the table. With all the division and chaos with Brexit, with all the wounds still open from the last independence campaign, with all the problems with schools, hospitals and social care, the last thing this country needs is to repeat the mistakes of Brexit. The last thing this country needs is more division and chaos that would surely come with another independence campaign. So will the First Minister listen? Will she listen to Scotland? Will she just make it stop? Yeah. Minister. I mean, in terms of the first part of Willie Rennie's uh, question, I mean, that's just such an utter mischaracterisation of what John Swinney said and did yeah. that I'm not going to engage particularly seriously uh, with that. But there is a real, a real contradiction. Some would say hypocrisy, but I'm going to stick with contradiction at the heart of Willie Rennie's position. I know he opposes independence. That is absolutely fine. The issue is not about his view or my view. The issue is about who decides. And Willie Rennie thinks that the people of the UK should have the chance to change their minds on Brexit. Yeah. And I agree with that. But Willie Rennie is adamantly opposed, no matter uh, everything that has changed in the last few years, yeah. adamantly opposed to the people of Scotland getting the chance to change their minds yeah. on independence. There is a real... Well, Willie Rennie's saying it's because uh, he opposes independence uh, and, and opposes Brexit, but that's like a Brexiteer saying, I don't want people to have a second referendum on Brexit because they might take a decision that I disagree with. <laughs> so <laughs> Willie Rennie, the Brexiteer, uh, yeah. strikes in this chamber. It's not about the views of politicians, it's about the views of the people. And I, I have to say to Willie Rennie, until he can somehow reconcile... Uh, that contradiction at the heart of his argument. I'm not sure many people across Scotland are going to take uh, his views on this particularly seriously. But again, I will repeat 
I will repeat the offer that I've made to other parties to Willie Rennie. You don't think independence is the right way forward, but Willie Rennie, surely even more so than Jackson Carlaw, cannot defend a situation in which Scotland faces being ripped out of the European Union against our will. Mike Rumbles is shouting, federalism, well, fine. Come forward, sit down with us, and let's discuss. But you know what? Federalism has been getting talked about in the UK for 100 years and more. We haven't yet found the UK government that's going to deliver it. That's the difference between federalism and independence. Federalism depends on a UK government delivering it. Independence depends on the people of Scotland taking that decision for themselves. Thank you. All the party leaders have had a chance to make their contributions, so if we can make uh, speedier progress through the uh, remaining uh, 26, 25 or so members who wish to ask a question. Uh, Keith Brown, was that, was that a groan? Keith Brown to be followed by Adam Tompkins. Keith Brown. In the context of the statement by a former Tory MP that if a union of free members sought to punish one of its members for wanting to leave it, the union, it would lose its claim to moral legitimacy. And the statement of a Tory minister that once you've hit the iceberg, the iceberg being Brexit, you're all in it together. Does the First Minister agree with me that Scotland has bigger things to deal with? And that the parties in this parliament need to rise above the vicious and vacuous party infighting we see at Westminster and the unfolding disaster of the UK's handling of Brexit, and not least amongst those things to deal with, the stability and prosperity of Scotland and its future as an independent nation within the EU. First Minister. Well, I have to say, the, the comment from an unnamed, and I'm not surprised they were uh, unnamed, uh, Tory, that we should all hit the iceberg together, I think does uh, say a lot about the mindset of the Conservatives about Scotland. I don't think any of but in the UK should want to hit an iceberg and I think Scotland should do everything we can uh, to prevent any part of the UK hitting an iceberg. But if the only option is to hit an iceberg, then what we in Scotland should be considering is how we get off the boat, uh, yes. not sailing to the iceberg. Uh, there is, uh, I believe, uh, surely a view that should uh, extend across all parties here that we can do better than this right now. We may have different views uh, on how to do so, uh, but we should not be accepting a situation where Scotland's fate uh, is decided by Westminster against the democratic wishes of the people of Scotland. And, you know, I simply say to those uh, on the Tory benches, but to Labour and the Liberal Democrats as well, uh, if you believe that the Scottish people don't want independence, why are you so scared to ask them the yeah. question? That really, that really is the question. Let the Scottish people decide. Uh, and if that is the case, I am confident that what the Scottish people will decide is to become a normal, equal, independent country able to play our full part in the EU and stop the damage to this and future generations that Brexit will undoubtedly do. Adam Tompkins, be followed by Neil Findlay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We won't squander valuable time, the First Minister said. She also said that her government will shortly introduce a framework bill into this Parliament, paving the way for an unwanted second independence referendum, and that her government will do this without first seeking a Section 30 order. A Section 30 order, as she says, would be necessary to put beyond doubt the legality of any future independence referendum. Yet she proposes now to act without one. So my question to her is this. How is plunging Scotland into yet more constitutional wrangling about legislative competence and constitutional process a sensible use of parliamentary time? We lost weeks over the failed continuity bill. Now we face losing months over an Indiref 2 framework bill. How is, this, how is this doing anything other than squandering valuable time? First Minister. Of course, Adam... Adam Tompkins argued that the continuity bill was not within the legislative competence of this parliament was when it was introduced. The Supreme Court, of course, took a very different view yes, to that. Very different view. And it was only because very Westminster subsequently changed the law uh, that, that uh, parts of that were then found to be incompetent. I'm not sure, for all his undoubted expertise on these matters, we should be listening too closely uh, to Adam Tompkins on issues of legislative competence. I have uh, no... No doubt uh, that the bill we will propose will be within legislative competence. Uh, if there is to be an independence referendum, we require to legislate for that, as we did in 2014. In 2014, we got a Section 30, then we legislated. This time, I'm proposing we do it the other way around. And why are we doing that? So that we protect the ability 
of Scotland uh, to avoid Brexit. If we can't do that through our efforts to stop the whole of the UK leaving the EU, then Scotland must have the opportunity uh, to protect itself from the damage that Brexit will do, damage to our economy, to our public services, to the opportunities and horizons of this and future generations. I don't call that squandering time, Mr Tompkins. I call that standing up for vital hey, Scottish yeah, interests. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Neil Findlay to be followed by Jenny Gilruth. Neil Findlay. Design officer, not a single patient will be treated better or quicker as a result of this statement. Not a single family will be lifted out of poverty yeah. and not a single child will receive a better education. The issue, the issue that is supposed to be the First Minister's top priority. We have the powers over all of these areas currently. So when will we hear a half hour statement and see rushed legislation from Nicola Sturgeon on these issues? And what has been sidelined from the planned legislative programme to deal with Nicola Sturgeon's real priority, independence? First Minister. Well, I'll be here again for 45 minutes tomorrow at 12 noon, answering questions on health, education, justice, the economy, yes. anything yes. the opposition yes. want to ask me about. Um, but I disagree with uh, Neil Finlay on his central premise here about the impact of the decisions we take now on patients who rely on our NHS, who children who rely on our schools. Uh, because if we allow the damage of Brexit to happen to this country, then what we are facing is a smaller economy, reduced revenues, a shrinking population, uh, and narrowed horizons for this and the next generation. That will hamper the ability, not just of this Scottish Government, but of Scottish governments to come to protect our health service, to protect our economy, and to protect our public services. That's why uh, we must act. And, you know, it's not this Government that needs uh, to be reminded about the day job. We do that day in and yeah. day out. Yeah, substantial yeah. policy yeah, yeah. work, more yeah. than a dozen substantial pieces of yeah. legislation before uh, this yeah. parliament. By contrast, the Westminster government, not one single piece of non-Brexit yeah. legislation, That's a true. Queen's speech that is indefinitely postponed. And the only policy ideas uh, in recent times, the uh, one about no-fault evictions and housing, this government has already implemented. Yeah. We got on with a day job every single day and we will continue yeah, yeah. to do so. Jenny Gilruth to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Jenny uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As the First Minister uh, has already mentioned, so broken is the Westminster system that even Murdo Fraser this week admitted that big parts of it should now be abolished. And given that most of this chamber will be in agreement that the current system is not working for Scotland, doesn't it demonstrate how important it is for all parties to come forward with ideas as to how to fix it? Yeah. Uh, yes, I do. Um, you know, there'll be a lot uh, of sound and fury in this chamber today, tomorrow, uh, and no doubt on many occasions about these issues. That's as it should be in a democracy. But I, I repeat the point I made in my statement. We all also have a duty to try to come together uh, to get over these uh, disagreements and to see if there is common ground. And it will be very telling, um, I think, in the next days and weeks, if any of the other parties are prepared to do that because that offer is there it is open it is sincere bring forward your proposals if you think my perspectives for scotland is wrong bring forward your proposals and let us see how much common ground can emerge from that but if all you have to offer people in scotland is a broken status quo where scotland can be ripped out of the eu against our will with all the damage that does uh, then really you should expect the process of change to completely pass you by because support for independence will continue to grow. Murdo Fraser to be followed by Annabel Ewing. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. The First Minister mentioned in her statement... Thank you. The First Minister mentioned in her statement the 62% of Scots who voted for the UK to remain in the EU a figure she describes as an overwhelming majority. Yet the latest poll on support for independence, commissioned by her party colleague Angus Robertson, shows an even more overwhelming majority of Scots support the union and reject independence. Now, given the First Minister is previously on record as saying she would not pursue another referendum unless there was demonstrable public support for independence, why is she now proposing to take us down the route of further division? First Minister. Uh, 
party manifesto in 2016, uh, the manifesto in which I was elected as First Minister, uh, said that if Scotland was taken out of the European Union against our will, then the people of Scotland should have the option to choose independence. Now, we're not yet out of the European Union, and I hope we don't get taken out of the European Union, but if we do, then the mandate in that manifesto, in my view, should be honoured and people in Scotland should have the right to choose. Um, and if Myrtle Fraser is so sure uh, that Scotland would choose not to be independent, then again, it begs the question I asked earlier on, why are the Tories so reluctant to allow people in Scotland to have that choice? Now, on the wider issues, uh, I've, I've mentioned Murdo Fraser a couple of times today and you know, I'm going to praise him again, uh, yeah, which will be yeah, utter yeah. death to his career <laughs> prospects yeah, yeah, if it yeah. hadn't already probably pretty much died um, some time <laughs> ago. But you know, credit to Murdo Fraser because Murdo Fraser, Murdo Fraser accepts that things as they are, are are not acceptable, they are not good enough. As it happens, I don't think his answer to put uh, more powers in some new chamber in Westminster is the answer. I think the answer is to bring powers to this chamber here in Scotland. Uh, but that's fine, we have different views. Uh, but given that Murdo Fraser uh, does accept that constitutional change is needed, then I hope he will persuade his party to take part in the process I've set out today and to come forward uh, with their own proposal. The one Murdo Fraser has already put forward and others. In that way, perhaps we can build some consensus. How does this parliament get equipped with powers that allow us to grow our economy, that allow us to better protect our public services and crucially to grow our population? Because the Tory uh, approach to migration at Westminster is the biggest threat yep. uh, to this country's prosperity that we face. So I hope Murdo Fraser, for once, will prevail in his party and get some common sense into them over the next period. Annabel Ewing to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. In 2014, Ruth Davidson said, and I quote, it's disingenuous to say no means out and yes means in, when actually the opposite is true. No means we stay in. We are members of the European Union, First Minister. That has been shown to be completely untrue. And is it not simply the case that we can't stand by and watch the dysfunctional Westminster system ruin Scotland's future? First Minister. Well, the reality that uh, those in the No campaign in 2014 don't like pointed out to them is that they told Scotland uh, that the way to protect our membership of the European Union was to vote against independence. Yeah. And here we are uh, finding that because we are not independent, we face being taken out of the European Union and our future has been determined uh, by a dozen countries the same size or smaller than us uh, with the UK out of the room. Uh, so that is the reality we face. Adam Tompkins is not listening right now, but it was him in 2014 who said there was very, very little chance of the UK voting yes. to leave the European Union. So that's the material change in circumstances that has happened since 2014. And that is why people in Scotland should have the ability to choose. Do they want uh, to be part of uh, Brexit Britain with all of the damage that comes with that? Or do we pre prefer uh, to have a future as an independent country, as part of the European family, uh, building those relationships on the basis of equality and building our prosperity on that basis as well. Uh, I think the people of Scotland, when given the choice, uh, will choose the latter to become a normal independent country. Rhoda Grant to be followed by Bruce Crawford. The First Minister cannot ask for genuine dialogue when she's already setting her direction of travel. This is a my way or the highway statement. She cannot expect people she cannot expect people to engage in honest dialogue within a citizens' assembly when she has already stated that she will hold an independence referendum before the end of the parliament. She is ignoring the settled will of the Scottish people and creating further chaos and uncertainty. Will she remove that threat in order to allow all parties to engage openly and honestly in what is best for our country? First Minister. Well, I'm going to... You know, respond to Rhoda Grant uh, in a, a very genuine uh, way because um, if she'd listened to my statement, and I'll say it again today, we need to, if we are to protect the ability, the option for Scotland to choose within this term of Parliament, we have to put uh, the, the plans for that in place. That's why I've set out the plans for legislation today. But I've always also, in an open way, invited other parties to come forward with their proposals. And I will be open-minded to that. If we can agree change that can be made uh, more quickly and in a different way, I am open-minded 
to that. Now, that is an offer that is made uh, in a genuine way, uh, and it is for other parties to decide whether they wish to engage with that. I hope the Labour Party uh, will. I'm less confident about the Tories. I hope the Labour Party will engage. I'm pretty confident the Greens will engage, and I hope the Liberals uh, will engage in that as well. Uh, in a democracy, uh, we shouldn't expect any of us uh, to put to one side uh, or to, to abandon the principles we hold dear. But as politicians, uh, the public should expect us uh, notwithstanding those deeply held convictions and differences between us, to try to come in together and see where the common ground is. I am willing to do that, uh, but we'll only make progress on that if the other parties are willing as well. So time, uh, I have to say, will tell. Bruce Crawford, to be followed by Maurice Golden. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. And this very welcome announcement from the First Minister, would you confirm that the significant point in all of this is that while we await any remote sense of clarity over Brexit from a Tory UK government at Westminster. In contrast, here at Holyrood, we can begin the preparations now for a referendum on Scotland's future in order to keep our options open. And shouldn't that be just what any sensible and reasonable government of any persuasion would do in such circumstances? First Minister. I think it is incumbent on any government to act in a way that best protects uh, the interests of the country that they serve. And that is what my government uh, will continue to seek to do. This Brexit situation is not of our choosing. It's not of the government's choosing, this parliament's choosing or the country's choosing. Uh, but we have to respond in a way that protects our interests as best we can. Uh, what I've set out today does that. It keeps the option of this country having the right to choose a different future to the Brexit one within the life of this parliament in line with the mandate we have, but it also opens the space uh, for others to come forward with different suggestions. And I hope that all of us uh, in this parliament will move forward on that basis. Maurice Golden to be followed by Sandra White. Uh, presiding officer, the first minister wants to establish a citizens assembly to help find consensus. Does the first minister really think this is possible when her nationalist agenda is driven by grievance and division. First Minister. <laughs> I have to say, there was a sense of grievance and division dripping from every <laughs> consonant that came out of Morris Golden's uh, mouth there. Look, you know, we will find out over the next period whether there is any uh, willingness on the part of all of the parties in this chamber to come to forward and try to, to find some agreement. Uh, I am willing to do that uh, and uh, as I've said many times before uh, the offer is there to other parties. The Citizens Assembly I think is something that all parties should be uh, enthusiastic about, should be prepared to uh, discuss the uh, details of that because it is uh, involving uh, people across Scotland in helping us to shape the decisions uh, we take uh, on behalf of the country. So notwithstanding the tone of that question, I, I hope the Conservatives, when they've had the time for some calm reflection and got over uh, having to talk again about Brexit, which I know they hate so much for obvious reasons, then we will find the Tories and Labour and the Liberal Democrats coming to the table to see whether we can find common ground amidst the disagreements that we have. Sandra White to be followed by James Kelly. Thank you very much, President Officer. Unlike some others, I very much welcome the proposal of Assistance Assembly. And I do echo the comments that came from Ireland, which said it got balanced and truthful information out amongst the people of Ireland. Therefore, can I ask the First Minister, which be able to give us assurances that this will be the case in their Assembly and ensure lessons will be learned in how not to conduct ourselves as so disastrously demonstrated by Brexiteers in this collapsing Westminster system? First Minister. Uh, yes, I would give those assurances. We will seek to discuss with others and with Parliament as a, a whole uh, the, the remit in the operation of the Citizens' Assembly. Um, won't surprise uh, the Chamber to hear that I think the experience of the 2014 referendum was very different to the 2016 referendum. Uh, we had a prospectus that people agreed with or disagreed with, uh, but a wealth of detail that people had to inform themselves before the decision in 2014 was taken. That was completely absent from the Brexit referendum. But I think we can go even further um, and use a citizens' assembly, amongst other things, to really understand the detail and the information that people want to have to make truly informed choices about uh, the future of the country and also to lay a foundation uh, so that whatever decisions we ultimately take as a country, people feel a sense of engagement and buy-in so that we can then move forward in a unified uh, manner. It's about trying to do things in a markedly different way 
to the whole Brexit process, which has caused so much uh, division and angst. And I think we can rise to that challenge in Scotland, and I hope all parties will help us ensure that we do. James Kelly to be followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you. People in Scotland don't want a second independence referendum. So why is the First Minister making the pursuit of independence a number one priority when there are record numbers of children in poverty in the country, when people are working in two and three jobs because of low pay and patients are stranded on NHS waiting lists waiting for treatment? First Minister. Well, I mean, James Kelly asserts that people in Scotland don't want uh, the choice of independence instead of Brexit. I, I just don't think he has the evidence for uh, that claim. But he also asked me why, why I think that's important. And he says when children are living in poverty, there are increasing numbers of children living in poverty because of the welfare cuts being imposed by a Tory government that Scotland didn't vote for. That's one reason for independence. He talks about people on low pay. Uh, of course, employment law remains reserved to a government in Westminster that the people of Scotland didn't vote for. Bringing powers back to this parliament uh, is how, or partly, how we resolve and address the challenges uh, that James Kelly has outlined. So I hope that although James Kelly and his colleagues don't support independence, I hope in the spirit of the question that he's just asked me, we will see Labour uh, come forward with proposals. They've already said, and I've welcomed this already today, that they now favour uh, the devolution of employment law. If they'd favoured that during the Smith Commission, we might already be uh, some way forward on that. But let's hear more proposals from Labour. And then we might find there is actually more agreement between the SNP and Labour than any of us like to admit. And for the Labour Party, uh, siding with the SNP in a few things would make a welcome change for their supporters uh, from seeing them side with the Tories on most things. Rona Mackay to be followed by Donald Cameron. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Even many Tories are alarmed about the prospect of an extreme Brexiteer such as Boris Johnson becoming Prime Minister. Is this not another example of why it's essential that this Parliament keeps Scotland's options open in the face of a clearly broken Westminster system that could inflict even more damage? First Minister. Well, when I set out the implications and consequences of uh, Brexit for Scotland, I didn't factor in uh, the prospect of somebody like Boris Johnson becoming Prime Minister. Uh, if that happens, and there is uh, apparently now a distinct possibility of that happening, uh, then the consequences that I outlined today would get uh, even worse for Scotland. Uh, and yes, I do think that makes the case for Scotland uh, being independent, taking charge of our own decisions, being in control of our own future, all the stronger. Uh, but interestingly, Presiding Officer, I've read uh, voices from within the Scottish Conservative Party saying that in the event of Boris Johnson becoming Prime Minister, the Scottish Conservative Party should become independent from the UK Conservative Party. So it seems independence is good enough for the Scottish Conservative Party. Why on earth would they want to deny the people of Scotland the same opportunity? <laughs> Donald Cameron to be followed by Ross Greer. Given that the Brexit vote will lead to more powers being transferred to this Parliament, and in light of the fact that the Scottish Government isn't currently using all the powers it already has, for example, handing back welfare powers to the DWP, how can the First Minister, how can the First Minister seriously contend that the status quo is broken and one answer is further devolution? First Minister. Well, powers have been taken away from this Parliament yeah. as a result of the Brexit process. And frankly, it really ill behoves the Tories to deny that that is the case. This Parliament with the exception of the Tories, was unanimous in opposing that Brexit power grab. So I uh, take the view that we should have more powers in this Parliament so that we can take our own decisions in this Parliament. And that is better than having those powers in the hands of Conservatives uh, that Scotland, uh, by and large, does not vote for. So I hope we will hear proposals to that effect from the Scottish Conservatives. Indeed. Ross Greer to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you. The Westminster government, in its desperation to stay in power, has proven itself profoundly unworthy of trust in negotiations. Considering the recent direct attacks on devolution and the deep inadequacies of the joint ministerial council structure, what safeguards and conditions has the Scottish government considered to ensure that talks with the UK government are conducted reasonably, respectfully and without the risk of their undermining Scotland's interests? First Minister. Well, right now there are no 
assurances of that, I'm, I'm sorry to say. You can have talks with the UK government and if the Welsh First Minister was standing here, I don't want to speak for him, but I'm pretty sure he and his predecessor would say the same thing. We can talk to we're blue in the face, but they don't listen um, and they don't act in a way that protects or advances Scotland's interests. Um, and that is uh, one example of the, the democratic deficit that I spoke about. Uh, not just the views of the Scottish people on Brexit, but the views of this parliament on Brexit, the views uh, not just of the government, but of a cross-party consensus in this parliament about the best way forward have been completely cast aside. And that, in my view, has underlined uh, and illustrated strongly the need for this parliament to have more powers, to have more control over these decisions that shape our future, and ultimately, of course, to be an independent country. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister confirmed that if Scotland is taken out of the EU by a failed Westminster system, we will progress to an independence referendum before the end of this Parliament in 2021. Can the First Minister say how she will take forward the mandate given to this Government in 2016 to ensure that Scotland can vote to secure its re-emergence as an independent sovereign state? First Minister. Well, I've set those steps out in my statement today. We will introduce legislation to protect the right for Scotland to have that choice within this Parliament. At an appropriate time, we will seek the transfer of power from Westminster that allows us to apply that to a choice on independence. Um, whatever our views on independence are, the fundamental point is this. Uh, if Scotland is faced, as we are, with uh, Brexit against our will, uh, then Scotland should have the choice as to whether it wants that or whether it wants to choose an alternative, an alternative being a sovereign, independent country able to play our full part in the European Union. That's the fundamental issue here. It should not be for any of us in this Parliament to determine that issue. It should be for the people of Scotland. Miles Briggs to be followed by Ian Gray. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. The First Minister has said she's open-minded and looking to build consensus and agreement. Now, if she's genuine in her sentiments, can I ask her, will she be open to drop this bid for a second independence referendum during this Parliament? First Minister. I've said I am open-minded to people coming forward uh, with proposals for change. If we it's can have question. serious and substantial proposals that deliver, perhaps not all of the change I want to see, but the change uh, that will help to protect this Parliament, then I am open-minded uh, to that. And I say that without precondition. Uh, so the onus really is on the Conservatives. Will they come forward in good faith and have that uh, discussion? If they do, they will find me uh, willing to have that in good faith. Ian Gray to be followed by Angela Constance. It is less than five years since I spent weeks on the Smith Commission exactly engaging in good faith with all parties here finding agreement on constitutional and procedural change. That agreement included significant tax and welfare powers, yet the First Minister has handed some of those powers back and refused to use others to tackle poverty and inequality. If the First Minister can organise another independence referendum by 2021, why will it take until 2022 to pay low-income families the income supplement she promised them? Yeah. Shouldn't the First Minister rise to the challenge of using the powers we all agreed in 2014 before we trust her to sit down and discuss what new powers we might need and want now? First Minister. Well, We'll bring forward our proposals on the low income supplement in June. That's what we said we would do. It doesn't do Ian Gray's case uh, any good, I think, for him to stand up here and say things like we've handed powers back when that is not true. Uh, there are carers across Scotland right now who have extra money in their pockets because of our use of welfare powers. There are low income families uh, getting the best start grant when they have a child because of our use of the welfare yep. powers and the process of completing that will benefit low-income individuals and families the length and breadth of this country. But on the issue of the Smith Commission, um, you know, Labour has changed their mind since the Smith Commission. Uh, Labour opposed the devolution of employment law uh, you know, firmly in the Smith Commission process and now, and I welcome this, Labour has changed its mind. We are in changed circumstances. One of the biggest risks facing this country now is uh, Westminster policy on immigration that threatens to put, uh, well, somebody said Tory policy. Jeremy Corbyn seems to agree with Theresa May on ending free movement. 
That will send our population into decline. We are in different circumstances. That's why we have to look afresh at the powers our Parliament has. So I believe at Labour, when it says it has ideas on that, let's bring them forward and see what consensus we are able to build. Angela Constance to be followed by Liz Smith. Thank you, President Officer. As the First Minister will be aware, the desire for independence is not born out of Brexit alone, but an anger, an anger at decisions taken at Westminster by a government that we did not elect, decisions that are increasing poverty, increasing food back use and increasing inequality in Scotland. So would the First Minister agree that it is these issues, along with Brexit, that underlie the need for Scotland to have all the powers to end poverty and for Scotland to be independent. First Minister. Yes, I, I agree very strongly with that. Brexit has illustrated uh, many of these points very sharply, has illustrated that democratic deficit that Scotland can vote overwhelmingly to stay in the EU and yet still faces being removed with all of the consequences that flow from that. Uh, but the essence of independence is not just about Brexit, it's about putting decisions about the future of our country into the hands of people who live here in Scotland. That's what happens in uh, countries all over the world. That's what should happen in Scotland too, so that we can work with uh, other countries in the British Isles on the basis of equality, but we don't have to have decisions that damage children uh, and interests of this country imposed on us by Westminster. That's why I want to see Scotland becoming an independent country. Liz Smith, to be followed by Mark MacDonald. Uh, the First Minister says very clearly in her statement that the politics of Brexit have been highly divisive. Does the First Minister accept that one reason for that division is the fact that the public feels that the result of its vote has not been implemented and that by trying to run a second independence referendum, the First Minister would be falling into exactly the same trap about trying to overrule what was a very decisive vote in 2014? Yeah. First Minister. <laughs> Well, I, I'm, I'm slightly confused at Liz Smith's question when she says the because we haven't let, yet left the EU, uh, the decision of the country hasn't been implemented. The decision of Scotland, the country that all of us are here to represent in this parliament, was to remain in the EU. Yeah. Uh, so, for, so far, it is uh, being implemented, and I hope it continues uh, to be so. Um, but I, you know, I hear, and, and actually, it's a legitimate point that I've heard the Conservatives make many times, and including, I think, Liz Smith, that. Uh, while the majority in Scotland uh, voted to remain in the EU, um, more than 30% voted to leave the EU and that we should do more to understand and respect that. And I actually agree with that and I think that's a responsibility on all of us. What I never hear the Tories saying is that there is a need to understand and respect the 45% who voted for Scottish independence. Yeah. The growing numbers of people in light of Brexit who want Scotland to be independent. Things have changed. And they have not changed for the better for Scotland within the UK. That's why I think it is right to look again at the powers of this parliament. I think it is right to become an independent country, to give people in Scotland that choice and not simply to sit back passively while Brexit, a policy we didn't vote for, does untold damage uh, to the interests of the country now and for many, many decades to come. Yeah. Mark MacDonald to be followed by Stuart McMillan. I welcome the First Minister's proposal for a citizens' assembly. I believe it's a concept that could have a wider applicability in future. But can I ask what steps the Scottish Government will take to ensure that the assembly captures the widest possible voice from within Scotland, particularly from minority communities and communities of disadvantage and poverty, whose voices are all too often not heard loudly enough in the debates that we have in this chamber and in the country as a whole? First Minister. Well, I think it's an important point to raise the model of a citizens' assembly by its very nature works if it is as representative of uh, the country uh, as possible. And that is not, and it's important to stress this point, not simply representative of different sides of a constitutional argument, but representative of the diversity of the country, the glorious diversity of the country. And that will be an important part uh, in constituting the citizens' assembly. I, I don't want to say any more about the detail of that because I think it's important we take time to discuss with other parties, uh, with stakeholders, how that is best taken taken forward, but I will give an assurance that that diversity uh, will be very much at the heart of what we seek to do. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Liam Kerr. Uh, I'm Officer, ever since it was uh, announced that the First Minister was going to be making this important statement, both the Tory and Labour benches have been squawking about getting on with the day job. But so for the avoidance of doubt, could the First Minister set out 
what actions the Scottish Government actually is doing and getting on with delivering for the people of Scotland? First Minister. Well, we do the day job every single day. I mean, you know, just, just in this month alone, we've extended free personal care to the under 65s. We've uh, introduced the new groundbreaking world leading domestic abuse uh, act. We've uh, we signed contracts for the Lawrence Kirk Junction, the Mabel Bypass. We have invested millions of pounds in schemes to tackle fuel poverty and low carbon initiatives. We've just in recent days, uh, we have invested money to make sure that children don't go hungry during the school holidays. We have, I think just this week, we've extended free tuition to uh, European students living here in Scotland. The list goes on uh, and on and on. And that's the responsibility we have and will continue uh, to discharge on a day-to-day -day basis. But this debate is about the day job. You know, when you listen to the Tories and Labour and the Liberals, it's almost as if we should somehow be oblivious to the Brexit juggernaut that yeah. is coming towards us yep. if we sit passively and allow that to hit us then the implications for our economy uh, for our population and for our revenues as a country will affect all of that and the ability of this and future Scottish governments to do that day job effectively that is why it's so important we don't let that happen that we allow people in Scotland to have the choice uh, of a better more prosperous future Liam Kerr to be followed by Claire Baker and officer, so on that day job, a few weeks ago, we learned that Scotland's police officers are chasing criminals in cars held together with duct tape. So I asked the First Minister, why is, why is endless constitutional wrangling order, and please, using order. resources to draft legislation, which may not even be competent and hinges on an event that may not even occur, more important to this First Minister than resourcing police constables on the front line? First Minister. Well, you know, this government is increasing the police budget. Uh, we've uh, just agreed uh, a pay award for our police officers that, according to the Scottish Police Federation, is the best pay award uh, in 20 years in Scotland. Uh, the Commissioner of the Met in London described the UK government's pay award to the police officers as a punch on the nose. Uh, so there's a bit of contrast. It's not this government that needs reminded of the day job. At Westminster right now, and this is a point Tories it should reflect on. There is not a single piece of non-Brexit legislation before the House of Commons right now. Uh, there is no policy agenda on any issue uh, except Brexit and they're making a complete and utter hash of Brexit. The Queen's speech apparently is not going to happen because they don't think they can get it through. By contrast, the reform policy reform programme that we have underway, the dozen or more pieces of substantial legislation before this parliament right yeah, now. So yeah. we will go on with delivering on health, on education, on the economy, on justice, but we will also do everything we can to protect the interests of Scotland from the actions of an incompetent Tory Westminster government. Claire Baker, followed by Susan McGregor. Claire Baker. Uh, President Officer, there is a contradiction in the First Minister's statement. She talks about so much division over Brexit. Does she recognise that for many, this was the experience and legacy of the 2014 referendum? When there is little appetite in the country for another referendum within the term of this Parliament, is she really prepared to cause greater division in our public discourse by pursuing this bill? First Minister. I say to Claire Baker, that wasn't my experience of the 2014 no. referendum, but I, <laughs> I accept that other people felt differently about that. Um, well, somebody's saying it's because uh, others were on the receiving end. You know, anybody would only have to go into my social media on a daily basis yeah, to see yeah. that I'm on the receiving end uh, of yeah. a, a fair amount of abuse. But the more important point here is this. We all of us should try to do things better and differently and in a way that accentuates uh, the agreement rather than the disagreement. You know, the answer to worrying about division or disagreement cannot simply to be to ignore the Brexit juggernaut or to suppress the differences of opinion about the future of the country. The answer has to be for all of us to rise to the challenge to see if we can confront the challenges our country faces in a more unified way. Uh, that's why I've made the offer I've made today and I hope that uh, people like Claire Baker in the Labour Party, who I know uh, wants to you know, look at how we do things more consensually, I hope she will prevail upon her party leadership to ensure that they enter into these discussions in the spirit in which they're offered. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Mike Rumbles. 
Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister may have seen comments from the Prime Minister's office today that crumbling Westminster has bigger things to deal with than Scotland. Would the First Minister join me in re reaffirming that the interests of Scotland are and always will be the top of this party's agenda? First Minister. Well, I, I have to say I've got some sympathy with the Prime Minister and the UK Government because there is no denying that the utter mess that they have made of Brexit is a pretty big thing for them to be having to deal with uh, right now. They're certainly not dealing with anything else in the UK on health, education, justice, the economy or anything. So it is a big thing for them to deal with. But, you know, there is, and if I was in the Scottish Tories, I would be despairing at that comment uh, this morning because it drips with contempt for Scotland. Uh, and for the idea that Scotland might not be entirely happy with the direction we're being taken in uh, by this Brexit-obsessed UK Tory government. Um, and, you know, I think that's a big problem for the Tories because what it says, it uh, backs up the experience we've had for these last three years. Uh, the Tories just want Scotland to uh, wheeshed and to keep quiet and to go along with yes. whatever they That's want. It. Well, That's I don't it. think that is right for These Scotland. And that is the difference between uh, those of us in these benches and the Conservatives. We think Scotland should stand up for its own interests and we think Scotland should have the right to choose its own future. Mike Rumbles to be followed by Bob Doris. <clears throat> the First Minister said that if the status quo with Westminster is not fit for purpose, how do we fix it? She asked the question. Does the First Minister not understand that the Liberal Democrats and others in this chamber support a renewed federal democracy for our United Kingdom? And that, and that her, insistence, her insistence on legislating with the aim of breaking up and dividing our United Kingdom totally undermines her siren calls for reaching agreement with other parties across the chamber? First Minister. I do accept and actually respect the long-standing view of the Liberals uh, of federalism. Uh, I do often wonder why in the years recently when the Liberals were in government at Westminster they didn't lift a finger to deliver the federal uh, Britain that uh, they claim to have uh, backed. Uh, but the question for those, and I'm absolutely you know, absolutely willing to sit down with any party in this chamber and to talk about those different visions uh, for how we fix what's wrong with our current system. Uh, but the answer to those who propose federalism, uh, or the question rather for those who propose federalism, is where's the UK government that's going to deliver it? Because we cannot uh, unilaterally turn the UK into a federal country. That requires uh, the UK government to act, and no UK government uh, in the history of the UK has shown any interest in delivering a federal Britain. Uh, the difference with independence is within our own control. If the people of Scotland choose to be independent, we don't have to rely on a Westminster government. That's a decision we can take for ourselves. So I will leave Mike Rumbles uh, to continue to beaver away, trying at some point to persuade a UK government to deliver federalism. And if he ever manages it, I will be the first to congratulate him for it. Bob Doris to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Uh, President Officer, I welcome the orderly and inclusive path outlined towards a second independence referendum here this afternoon. But First Minister, given deprived areas still tend to have lower electoral turnouts, will the First Minister consider the opportunities that a citizens' assembly may present to boost democratic participation in some of our most deprived communities? First Minister. Uh, yeah, I do think the citizens' assembly model, I mean, we don't have... Uh, it's not the case that we have no experience of it in Scotland. If we look at the work we did uh, in advance of establishing the Social Security Agency, we used a, a model not dissimilar to that, but we don't have the same experience that Ireland, for example, does. But I think this model uh, really could be very powerful in trying to engage uh, people in all of our communities uh, in the democratic process and in how they can influence the democratic process. And it's one of the reasons I look forward to discussing with parties how we take that forward. Graham Simpson. Thank you. Um, the First Minister talks about a busy legislative programme, um, but if she wants this framework bill on the statute uh, books this year, as she says she does, there will bound to be an effect on that programme. Can she tell us which bills or proposed bills are likely to be delayed? First Minister. I don't expect this to uh, have an effect on any of the other bills before uh, the Scottish Parliament. I'm sure all MSPs across the Parliament are capable of working hard enough uh, to deliver the legislative programme that's before us just now with an additional bill added in. Thank you very much. That concludes this afternoon's statement. We're going to move on shortly to uh, portfolio questions. We'll just take a, a second or two for ministers and members to change seats.
Uh, thank you. Time is tight, so I'll move on. Next item of business is portfolio questions. And as usual, to get as many people in as possible, I'd like short, succinct questions, followed by short, succinct answers. Question one, Bruce Crawford. <coughs> to ask the Scottish Government how the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018 will change the way in which domestic abuse is tackled. Cabinet Secretary. The Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018 creates a specific offence covering not only physical abuse but other forms of psychological abuse and controlling behaviour that were previously difficult to prosecute. The Act creates a course of conduct offence for the first time, making it easier for police and prosecutors to investigate and prosecute domestic abuse as a single offence, enabling physical, psychological and controlling behaviour by a partner or ex-partner to be prosecuted at once. It reflects the fact that children are harmed by domestic abuse by creating a statutory aggravator in relation to children and will enable the court for the first time to use a non-harassment order to protect children as well as the adult victim of the offence. Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer? <coughs> Excuse me. In preparation for changes in the legislation, can the Cabinet Secretary tell me how much the Scottish Government has provided Police Scotland in order to support police officers understanding the dynamics of power and control in abusive relationships and to help them recognise the signs of coercive and controlling behaviour. Cabinet Secretary. I think it's a really important point raised by uh, Bruce Crawford because, the, of course, legislation came into force, as he, know, as he knows and members will know at the beginning of the month. That was to allow that training to have to take place. Um, we gave, to directly answer this question, 825 thousand pounds of funding to Police Scotland. Uh, that was to support the development of training of 14,000 police officers and staff. Uh, police Scotland have also developed a self-completion e-learning package on the new legislation which is made available to 22,000 staff. Um, as well as that, Lord President committed to ensuring all members of the judiciary receive training uh, on the Act uh, and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service have developed a package of training uh, for our prosecutors uh, as well. And we've also provided 166,000 to Scottish Women's Aid to develop training around the new offence in the Domestic Abuse Act. Margaret Mitchell, followed by Daniel Jones. In the response to the Justice Committee report on the Domestic Abuse Act, the Scottish Government accepted it's possible that the creation of new coercive controlling behaviour offence could lead to an increased cost for local authorities with regards to the increased demand for criminal justice social work services. Given the CGSW budget for the previous two years has remained static, will the Cabinet Secretary confirm the necessary funding to cope with the anticipated increase in costs will be made available to local authorities. Cabinet Secretary. Well, it's important to note within that question that Margaret Mitchell uh, asking a very uh, uh, important question that she asks, um, that of course we have ring-fenced uh, that budget uh, for local authorities. My uh, conversations with uh, COSLA and local authorities continue, uh, of course, on this matter, of course, also with any additional pressures they may face with the passing of the presumption against short sentences uh, as well, um, uh, for which we've made additional budgets available. So I'll continue those conversations. Um, I'm very aware of those budget pressures that may well exist, um, but uh, as I say, my conversations and engagement uh, with the local authorities are, are very constructive on this matter. Daniel Jones. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, the issue of training is an important one with regard to domestic abuse, and indeed in some jurisdictions, specialist officers are trained to degree level. So can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary what discussions he's held with Police Scotland and the SPA uh, regarding the possibility of higher level training, indeed to degree level, for specialist officers in this area? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, it's not something that Police Scotland have raised uh, with me, nor either the uh, number of organisations such as Scottish Women's Aid, uh, that, 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 that represent uh, women and female victims in particular uh, of domestic abuse. That, that's not been raised with me that there needs to be additional training than the funding, the training that we have uh, funded or indeed uh, the training that uh, Scottish Women's Aid have provided. But I'll certainly in my, my next conversations uh, with Police Scotland and indeed with the other organisations that represent victims of domestic abuse uh, raise that issue about further training and I'll take the conversation from there. Question two, Phil McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it can take to support vulnerable witnesses before, during and after criminal court proceedings. Cabinet Secretary. The Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act 2014 introduced measures to support vulnerable witnesses and requires criminal justice agencies to set and monitor standards of service. The Vulnerable Witnesses Bill aims to improve how child and uh, eventually other, other vulnerable witnesses give evidence through the enhanced use of pre-recording. 
Uh, we're also providing £18 million pounds in 2019-20 to fund a range of services which victims and witnesses can access before, during and after criminal proceedings. The Victims Task Force, which I co-chair alongside the Lord Advocate, is considering additional actions to improve end-to-end -end support for victims and witnesses throughout the criminal justice process and beyond. Fulton McGregor. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response and I welcome the Vulnerable Witnesses Bill, uh, which recently passed through the, the Justice Committee. I have been contacted by constituents whose children were witnesses at court giving evidence in a crime where they were the victims. Although there was a successful conviction, which was very welcome, the families failed to support the special and, and emotional nature was not provided to their children by the justice system or the local authority, particularly in the period following the conviction. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise how children who are both victims and witnesses can be better supported emotionally and to better understand the court processes and the possible outcomes? And would he consider meeting with these families to hear firsthand about their experiences? Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Fulton uh, McGregor for his question? Can I express uh, my sympathies to, 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 to those families, and particularly young people that had to go through that process. Uh, that would have been a traumatic experience, I don't doubt, uh, from everything that uh, he is saying. And, and I know these things are not easy uh, at all, and it's exactly the kind of questions and exactly the kind of issues that Lord Advocate and I are exploring uh, as the co-chairs of, of, of the Victims uh, Task Force. Uh, of course, the Victims and, and Witnesses uh, Bill is, is going through um, the, 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 the Parliament, or the Vulnerable Witnesses Bill is going through Parliament uh, currently, which he knows, and is, of course, uh, has an input in uh, as, as a member of the Justice Committee, that will make a big, big difference to children that in the future have to go through uh, a court uh, process. In terms of the specifics of the case, uh, I would ask that Fulton McGregor perhaps writes to me in the first instance with the detail of the case, uh, and from there I will judge whether it's appropriate as Justice Secretary for me uh, to meet. I have no fundamental objection, uh, but it may be those issues are perhaps in other uh, people's jurisdiction uh, or indeed uh, remit, but of course I will, I will uh, look at that uh, very favourably. I know you wish to be polite, Cabinet Secretary, but if you could face the microphone so that we can hear your answer. Question uh, three, Finlay Carson. This government, what its position is on the way in which the Control of Dogs Scotland Act 2010 has been implemented? Um, that's Minister. The Control of Dogs Act 2010 provides local authorities with powers to impose dog control notices where a dog is deemed to be out of control. And we are aware that some local authorities have imposed a considerable number of dog control notices, whilst others have not. But however, this may reflect the fact that some local authorities are choosing to make greater use of informal warnings to dog owners. As the member will know, the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee is currently undertaking scrutiny of that Act, and we will cons carefully consider the Committee's findings when that review is complete. Finley Carson. I thank the Minister for that response. It appears that because it's not government legislation that little has been done to promote it, it's claimed that even police officers don't know all about the, the control that was brought in almost a decade ago. Currently, the laws on dangerous dogs and sheep worrying is fragmented between various acts and statutory instruments, both devolved and, uh, and, and at UK level. Doesn't the Minister agree with me that we need an all-encompassing piece of legislation with clear powers outlined to ensure both enforcers and the public are clearly aware that their respective roles and responsibilities are in the control of dogs? The 2010 Act provides uh, please, the tools briefly. To, to consolidate that and uh, to cover uh, multiple members' bills. Thank you. Minister. Uh, the member raised a number of different points uh, there. I'll address the one about awareness. The Scottish Government is always um, uh, very keen to assist in awareness raising. Um, the dog control notice is obviously run by local authorities, but we'd be very happy to take part in, in further awareness raising work that might be helpful to communities on that. But in terms of the issue regarding livestock worrying, um, we are aware that there are concerns that dog control notices are not generally used for incidents of livestock worrying or livestock attack, as it's sometimes called. And this, as this is something uh, that the police, rather than the local authority officers, would normally deal with. Um, so I'm sure the member will be aware that Ms Harper's uh, bill proposal is currently out for public consultation and I would encourage people to respond and offer their views on those proposals. So segue to Emma Harper, please. Thank you, President Officer. The Control of Dogs Act 2010 doesn't specifically refer to livestock worry or livestock attack. It uses the words apprehension, which is that's why it's not strong enough. So does the minister actually then agree with me that we should encourage people to feed into the consultation so that we can get a better piece of legislation to better protect our farmers' livestock from attacks by out-of-control dogs? Minister, briefly, please. 
Uh, the Scottish Government does recognise the impact of dog attacks on livestock and we are committed to working with all our partners um, to tackle this. But I do agree with the member. Uh, I think all those who have an interest in this should have a look at the consultation that Emma Harper has put forward. 